How are you going? Are you having a good day? Well, I'm going to tell a little bit of a story about the Hawaiian mongoose, the Queensland cane toad and the police farces, if you'd like to stick around for that. Here's how it goes. Once upon a time, the Hawaiian Islands had the luck to have been discovered by the Great British Empire. And the Great British Empire discovered Hawaii by means of wooden hulled sailing boats. And the sailing boats and ships were infested with rats. And the story goes that the rats desert a sinking ship in the sense that before the vessel departs from harbour the rats run away down the anchor lines because they don't want to go to sea on a boat that's going to sink. Rats apparently know something about maritime design. So therefore some of the British Empire sailing ships which visited Hawaii which were destined to float off into the ocean and never be seen again discharged their cargo of rats onto the Hawaiian Islands back in the 1700s. And Rattus Raticus, Rattus Norwegicus, whatever it was, the European rat, when it got to Hawaii, it had no predators. And there were lots of ground nesting birds that had been used to having no predators and the rats went amok. They ate nearly all of the birds. Several species of ground nesting birds were nearly extinct. And that's when the Great British Empire decided that they were going to have a bit of a go at what they called biological imperialism. Are you still following this? Biological imperialism means they would grab one species that was good at one, being in one place and take it halfway around the world and inflict it on somewhere else. Yes, you understand that, don't you? Mmm. Absolutely. Yeah, just like bloody sheep, aren't they? Yeah? So, in the same manner that the British biological imperialists were having to bring indentured labour from India to Hawaii and Fiji to work on their plantations because the indigenous population just weren't interested, it occurred to somebody that they might be able to sort of nip this problem with the rats in the bud if they also imported from India a breeding selection of mongooses. So the British released the mongoose, mongoose, mongoi, in Hawaii. So the story goes, and I read this story in a book called Still Life with Woodpecker, which was written by Tom Robbins, very successful author, back in the 70s. And it was all a wonderful idea on paper, sitting in London thinking it all out but what actually happened was that the rats work at night the mongooses or mongoose they work during the day because they're pretty much designed and specialized and fine-tuning for hunting snakes and they've got to be able to see what they're doing so the mongooses that were designed for the day never met up with the rats that were working at night and the mongooses got pretty hungry so they started on the rest of the ground nesting parrots and birds and they rendered them extinct and then they started to move on to domestic fowls and poultry and uh, dogs and cats and babies in prams and slow moving lawnmowers and by the middle of the 20th century the Hawaiians had had an absolute total gutful of introduced species and they started to develop some pretty strict policy against trying to use mongooses or anything else being brought into Hawaii Okay, that might be total fiction, but it meshes pretty well with the story of the Queensland cane toad. And once upon a time, the cane growers in Queensland were suffering from a plague of things they called cane beetles. They weren't very imaginative, you see. They couldn't come up with any sort of a fancy word for them. But the cane beetles were causing them major economic problems, so what they decided to do was find something that would eat the cane beetles. And we had an outfit called the CSIRO, Commonwealth Scientific Industrial Research Organisation. And they'd had a bit of success with biological control with a thing called a prickly pear which had been introduced by some lunatic for decorative purposes and which because it had no predators had run all over the country and had millions of acres, perhaps 
hundreds of thousands of square miles under prickly pear and uninhabitable. You couldn't approach the country. So uh, they gave big patches of it to war veterans and said, you know, if you can clear an acre a year, well, you can have a thousand acres. Um, and then the CSIRO found a moth and a caterpillar called the Cactoblastosis moth. And they let that go, and it had no predators, but it also had no food except for this ridiculous cactus. And within five or ten years, the prickly pear was no longer a problem, and all the soldier settlers who'd been given prickly pear blocks had a bloody lot of land to, you know, annoy with sheep and all sorts of European schemes. So the CSIRO decided to find something that would eat the cane beetle, and they, they lobbed onto a thing called Bufo marinus, a.k.a. the cane toad. And in the laboratory it looked good. You put your cane toad on the table, you get your beetle and dangle it on a string in front of the cane toad, and what happens is snap. The toad eats the beetle, so they introduce these bloody things. And you know what? That's when these brilliant scientists at the CSIRO noticed that the cane toad lives on the ground and the cane beetle lives six or eight feet off the ground at the top end of the plant. So it was just like the mongoose and the rats. They never ever met each other. And like the mongoose, employed to control the rats, caused a problem of its own and didn't touch the original problem. The cane toad didn't touch the cane beetle, but it became a problem on its own because it was poisonous and aggressive and it's still moving across Australia and the leading edge have evolved longer legs and that they move faster than the ones in the succeeding waves, the colonist cane toads. Um, vast areas have been denuded of goannas and eagles and raptors and dingoes. The cane toads have proven a bit of a disaster, but ideally, hopefully, there may be some kind of a new balance established because in the areas which have had cane toads for 20 or 30 years the goannas are starting to come back and they either leave the cane toads alone or they've figured out a way to turn them over and not get hit by the poison glands on the back of the head. So this brings us to polyse farces. I'm sure you know that globally the planet has a bit of a problem with policing. Excessive policing, expensive policing, incompetent policing, police brutality. It's a worry. And it all seems to have started, modern times that is, with the London Municipal Council. Over there they had a problem with criminals. They decided, they voted to, they passed an act to set up a citizen militia civil militia in order to conduct a polis patrol on the streets to clean out the human scum in the same way as there was a polis patrol to clean the chamber pots in the public houses. This was before Thomas Crapper invented the water closet for shitting in, so they had ceramic pots under the beds with a linen cloth cover. And every morning there was a polis patrol whose job was to get the chamber pots, take them away, empty them, wash them, dip them in boiling water, therefore killing any lice and any nits and any eggs so that they could be put with a freshly laundered and boiled cloth under the bed so that the patrons the next night didn't catch lice from the previous night's patrons. A police patrol. Right. So there was a fellow called Peel, Richard William Peel. And he personally has sort of contributed lots of names for citizen militia. You've got the old Bill, right? William. You've got Private Dick, Dick short for Richard. You've got the Peelers, collective slang term for police. You've also got Gumshoe. And I'm pretty sure that he was the one who introduced synthetic compound souls, or at least the police were using them first to sneak up on people. But the problem with the polis forces to clean up the criminals is that the polis forces work during the day and the criminals work at night, out of sight. They don't meet up, just like the mongooses and the rats. And society had a crime problem, they hired cops and now they've got a cop problem. In Queensland, trying to lead the world, um, the cop problem seems to be that police 
honestly believe that every time they arrest somebody, that person should automatically be found guilty, like in Japan, where there's a 99.9% .9 conviction rate. Nobody ever goes to court and gets found guilty in Japan. Well, that's how the Queensland Police would like it to be. And they would also like there to be a maximum sentence every time. They are greatly bolstered by various victims associations and lobbies who don't like the idea that there is an impartial person who has to judge the scale and the magnitude of the crime viewed against the weft and warp and weave of society as a whole rather than putting the spotlight just on the one little thing. And if somebody steals your handbag it might be the worst thing that happens to you all bloody year. But when you put that up against pack rapists people who use violence in order to conduct a robbery, punch people in the head rather than just grab the handbag. Now there's got to be a scale and if murdering somebody gets you 25 years to life then you can't go locking people up for 15 or 20 years for a very minor offence. There has to be a balance. But the cops don't want that. And in Queensland Somehow, the cops have got the ear of the politicians. And instead of the police enforcing the law, they're headed for a situation up there where the police are drafting the law and the politicians are rubber stamping it. And the police and the politicians in Queensland don't seem to understand human rights conventions or the right to free association, freedom of thought, freedom of speech, freedom of movement, the principle of equality before the law, the right to be judged by someone independent of the police and independent of the politicians. They're really taking a leap back to 17th century Romania. So all in all, Queensland has a cop problem. employing cops to stop crime rather than uh, cuddling the babies and teaching them not to grow up to be criminals it's just a bloody waste of time it's just like setting mongoose after rats or cane toads after sugar cane beetles more cops are not an effective way to deal with crime at least that's what I reckon. I reckon every human parent should put as much work into raising their kid as a wallaby or a kangaroo does in teaching a joey how to live in its environment. What's safe, what's not safe, what you can approach, what you've got to stay away from. What do you think about that, eh? Good on you, mate. You're interested in two-stroke oil condensers, are you? They're a feature of swamp wallaby life. Hmm. Okay. of a swamp wallaby convention here they must like this lecture the story of the Hawaiian mongoose the Queensland cane toad and the polis farces warbles on a lot to YouTube ciao what do you think swamp wallaby over there you're still harassing that thing goodbye <laughs>